beautiful. Well, I want to welcome everybody here to our lovely church community today. Thanks for being here. Thanks for tuning in online. And I just want to celebrate. I forgot that sunlight can look this beautiful. How about anyone else? I saw a glowing orb in the sky a few times this week, and I just had to stop, just put my face in the sunshine. And I had something magical happen. My very first daffodil popped up in front of my house. So spring is on its way, and it it got me thinking, oh, springtime changes. What does the Bible say about spring? So as I was getting ready for announcements, I looked up a few Bible verses on spring, and almost everyone mentioned spring rain. Rain, rain, rain. I was like, we have had enough rain. I don't want to share anything more about spring rain. So here is a Bible verse that I think is very appropriate. It says, in Isaiah chapter 43, behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. I just think it's very appropriate as we gather as a church family to pray together, to worship together. And even our little Wednesday morning prayer time, it feels like something new is springing forth. So I want to share a few exciting things that are also springing forth in the church We have next Sabbath, there is the social committee is putting on a fun game night, so there will be some refreshments, some games, bring a favorite board game if you'd like to. So that is next Sabbath at 6 p.m. And there is an opportunity for a time of prayer together. The Oregon Conference is sharing a Zoom link. And just to pray through some of the challenges for the Oregon Conference and to be reminded that, hey, God is making roads you know, where we don't always see ways. So it's the time to come together, church family. That'll start at 5.30. Games are starting at 6. So we invite you to both, whatever you can join. It'll be a good time. And just to share community, um, it's so worth it. So another thing I want to share is that the women's ministry retreat is happening on March 15 to 17. And I want to paint a picture. It's Lincoln City, Oregon Coast, ocean views near the beach, There are decks overlooking the ocean, and there's a hot tub. And in case you missed that, there is a hot tub on on the beach. Okay, so details how to register is either at the church app or the info station there. You can come sign up. The window to register is closing on, let me see here, it's March 6th is the deadline. So be sure to register. There's limited space, but if you are a lady or you know someone who would like to be a part of it, we would love to. Well, I won't be there, but they would love to have you there. So one last thing is that there is openings for our church choir. We practice right after Sabbath small groups or Sabbath school, and we need especially some good, strong male voices. So if you enjoy singing, if you've ever sang in the past, Not a ton of experience is needed. We invite you to come right after Sabbath school, Sabbath small groups, and join the the choir, which we will be putting together a program for Easter. So that'll be a lot of fun. So I just want to share that, and do you mind if I have a quick prayer with you guys? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can trust that you are springing forth a new thing, God. You're bringing something new in our hearts, individually in our families, and also in this church community, God. And we just trust you with the exciting season ahead, and thank you so much for sunshine. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand with me to sing our opening hymn.
Let's remain standing as we pray. I'd like to add one name to our prayer list this morning that just came to me. Ron Mitchell is having problems with severe edema in his legs. It's a medical condition that's landed him in the hospital previous, and he's a little bit nervous, requesting our prayers this morning. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, how good it is to be in your house this morning. We love the sunshine and the full moon last night. Thank you for placing around us all the beauty of your creation, the spring colors that are starting to bud out on the trees, the green grass and leaves. Thank you so much for the beauty that we have. Father, we've gathered together this morning as a church family. Our goal is to bring honor and worship to Jesus, to thank him for all that he does in our lives, for the strength that he gives us for the mercy that he has toward us. And in our weakness, there are times when we fail, and he's always there to forgive us and lift us up. And we just praise him for that. Father, we, we just pray for your Holy Spirit to come, not only in this church as a whole, but in each of us individually. We need that so you can guide our steps so that we can follow the path that you want. Open our eyes that we would see opportunities to witness, to bring blessing to others, and to rightly represent your character. Father, there are a number of people on our prayer list. We just added Ron. There are so many people on our list that are having problems with health. And we just pray for healing. We pray for recovery. We pray for strength and peace as they face these issues. For those who are suffering with grief over the loss of a, of a loved one, we just pray for your spirit and your arms to be wrapped around them, that they would have peace, that they would have that blessed confidence that one day this will all be over, families will be reunited, and we can share eternity with you. Father, we ask your blessing on Pastor Jack as he ministers to us this morning. We thank you for this worship time and, and for the, the strength and the peace that we get from spending time alone with you. While it's important to pray together, it's praying individually that brings that real strength that we each need so desperately. Bless our worship time this morning. We pray that until that day when we can all get together in heaven, that you would help us to remain true and faithful. We pray it in Christ's holy name. Amen. Hi, TVA family. It's been a great month and time has flown. February is when we partner with the American Heart Association for our annual Kids Heart Challenge service project. Students have been working to raise money to support teaching life-saving CPR in the community. High school students participated in another service project, working with Hillsboro Downtown Partnership to help them inventory and assess the health of street trees. We're glad for these service opportunities that encourage our students to connect with our community. Lots of academic learning has been going on too. Kindergarten worked on reading and sentence structure with fun learning stations they got to rotate through. Third graders earned various parts of a banana split for each set of multiplication tables they learned, and the whole class celebrated with an ice cream sundae party. Fourth grade built models of the human hand to learn about both the structure and mechanics of how it works. Fifth grade learned about the steps of the scientific process as they hypothesized about what happens to gummy worms soaked in water. Sixth grade built candy DNA models and did a dissection in class. And high school's Game Dev Studio students have been designing concept art for their games. In library this month, students studied Lunar New Year and Black History Month. Not only are they reading, but they are putting Mrs. Halverson's makerspace to good use with hands-on projects to support their learning. 7th and 8th grade basketball is wrapping up and 3rd and 4th basketball has started. Teamwork, Christian leadership, and Christian character are foundational to our athletics program, and we are proud of our students' skill growth and sportsmanship. With February comes Valentine's Day, and we celebrated with fun activities and Valentine's Day-themed learning. One especially fun project was when 7th and 8th grade did a candy dissection in the high school science lab. They followed a series of instructions to dissect and reassemble their candy and got some hands-on experience with the lab's dissection tools. High school students acted as lab assistants and it was a lot of fun. 
Enrollment is open now, so if you are looking to join our TVA family, check out our website for those details. Open House is coming up on March 19th from 6 to 8 p.m., and everyone is welcome to join us to get to know our program and teachers and to see what our students have been up to this year. With Valentine's Day, we reflect on love, especially God's love for us. God loves us so much that he sent his son to earth to die for us so that we can live in heaven forever with him. It's a precious gift, and it's one we work to share with our students every day. Thank you, TVA family, for your love and support for our school. We appreciate you. As always, you can keep up with us on Instagram and Facebook. Thanks, TVA family. I've heard many of you share that you really enjoy seeing those uh, reports from TVA just to get a glimpse of what is happening over at the school. Others have asked me, uh, why do we show these once a month? Well, I just, uh, let me put it this way. Uh, we are in partnered ministry with Tualatin Valley Academy. Uh, our church would not be the church that it is if we didn't have a wonderful school sitting nearby that we were a part of. And TVA would not be the school that it is if it didn't have a church like ours, the Beaverton Adventist Church, and a collective of other churches here on the west side supporting it. And we are partnered together in ministry. And that is evident in our local church budget giving. When we give to local church budget, we are significantly supporting what you see here on this video. And we praise God for the blessings that flow both ways, both ways. I want to mention to you just quickly a little more about TVA. Tomorrow, in fact, from 10 to noon, just a two-hour window, uh, is, uh, is a, a TVA cleaning work bee. And uh, no skills required other than just a willingness to pitch in for just a little while. And, and you're invited to just come and to be willing to say, what, how can I help? And they will point you in a direction. We need these windows cleaned or something that needs done. And, and you'll have an opportunity to just contribute in a simple way. I also want to mention this, is that last, um, oh, I don't remember the occasion, but a little while ago there was a North American division uh, meeting for teachers, and one of our teachers kind of uh, pitched an idea and kind of like a Shark Tank kind of concept and was granted some funds that TVA will be hosting a West Side Vacation Bible School this coming summer in June. And on Monday, February 26, from 7 to 8 p.m., there will be kind of an informational meeting. And, of course, it's going to take a lot of extra help and hands to make that VBS happen. And I just wanted to put that out there for you, that the school will be serving the area churches this summer in that way. And it, it's, a, it's a big project. And if you have any notion of saying, I think I'd like to find a way to help, um, you can be a part of that informational meeting, or as time gets closer, we'll certainly identify the needs further. Finally, last thing I want to share is I have, uh, I have kind of been bumping into TVA for a long time now. And presently, I have the privilege for a season to serve as the school board chair. And I see something happening about this time of the year every year. You know what that is? Teachers are getting tired. It's been, it's been a, a big chunk of the school year, and, and the, the renewed energies from Christmas break have been drained already, and it's just, a, it's just that time of the year where it's like, oh, I, I love what I do, but I'm getting tired. And so as we have a little word of prayer today, I, I want to just pray over TVA and pray a special prayer for the, the teachers to have renewed stamina to continue in their calling. So let's pray together. Our God in heaven, thank you for Tualatin Valley Academy. Thank you for the blessings it, it brings to us as a church family, and thank you for the privilege that we get to bring blessings to them. Lord, we're not two separate entities. Uh, we're one and the same, partnered together in serving you and serving others. Uh, Lord, we pray for blessings of provision at TVA, that every need that is represented there, every resource that is needed, that you would supply, and we'll trust you with all these things. And Lord, one thing that I know is in short supply often around this time of the year is just the energies to press on. And uh, we just pray, Lord, for our teachers at TVA. Why not expand it to our teachers at the Oregon Conference? And just pray that you would give them fresh wind and new stamina to bring their absolute best to the classroom every day. 
Bless the students, Lord, that are blessed to be there, and, and may they truly be uplifted and guided toward you. And uh, finally, Lord, we just pray that the initiatives of VBS and all the other activities they seek to do, that you would bless in every way. Thank you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, it's time for our children's story today. And Mrs. Clara Kelly has the story. And boys and girls, we'd like for you to sit kind of over here after you circulate with your little pail and receive that offering. Appreciate those little offerings that are given. They go to help reduce our call to grow kind of debt reduction. And they certainly are a blessing and they add up in a beautiful way. So boys and girls, smile and say thank you. And as soon as you can, come right on up to the front for children's story. You guys were really busy today, weren't you already? <laughs> Good morning, boys and girls. Now, if you are a cat lover, today is a nature corner for you because we are going to be talking about a particular kind of cat. They call it a tortoiseshell cat, it's affectionately called torties. Can you see the picture, what they look like? Now, I have to first, I'm going to be calling them tortoiseshell cats, but it's not a kind of cat. It's a pattern on a cat. Do you see the markings on this beautiful cat? Lots of different cats can have this tortoiseshell pattern. You see there's several different kinds, and they all have these beautiful colored markings that are kind of chocolatey brown, sometimes a black with little bits of of gold and cream and orange in there and now the experts disagree on this next part some say no white at all and some say very little white so i'll let them duke that out and figure it out themselves but almost no white at least did you know that almost all tortoiseshell cats are females how about that 99.9% .9 are females, only one in 3,000 are male. If you're interested in genetics, and you can check into that and figure that one out too. 
And what, they, what that name comes from is because it looks like the beautiful pattern on a sea turtle, which is called a tortoise. Do you see the shell, the beautiful colors that are like the tortoise shell cat? And it has become so popular that even glasses and sunglasses have been made in this same pattern. Now, I don't want you to get it mixed up with the calico cat. You can, can you see the difference? The calico has a lot more what on it? More white, yes. And otherwise, the colors are very similar. Uh, but that's the difference between them. Now, I've told you all of this to tell you the story of Tink, the tortoise shell cat. Now, Tink lives in England with her owners, Claire and Russell, and their two kids. And in 2016, she won the Cat of the Year Award. Now, what would a cat have to do to win the Cat of the Year Award? Actually, it was something that happened in the middle of the night. And before I can tell you the rest of the story, we first have to talk about ways that cats wake you up. Here's one way. And if that doesn't work, here's another way. And if all else fails, then there's this way, of course. But one night, Tink woke up and she smelled and she saw smoke in the house. And that was even before the smoke alarm went off. And she ran into Claire and Russell's room and she did something that she had never done before. I don't know how they trained her to do this, but she never got on the bed. She didn't sleep on the bed and she never got on the bed, but she jumped up on the bed and she got right next to Claire and she took both of her front paws and thumped Claire really hard on her legs and it woke her up. And of course, then Claire saw all the smoke and smelled the smoke and she woke up her husband and got the kids up and they all rushed out of the house and in all the confusion of getting out, guess what Tink did? She panicked and she ran back into the house. And so when the firefighters came and they asked, is there anybody else in the house? They told them, yes, their cat Tink was in there. So the firefighters apparently know where cats like to go and hide. So they went in and pretty quickly they found Tink and they brought her out, but she was totally limp. And they were afraid, oh no, she's gone. But did you know that firefighters have something called a pet oxygen mask? And this is what they look like. This is not a picture of Tink, although the one on the right looks like it could be. And this is how they put it on their little face. So Tink had an oxygen mask for about an hour. And after an hour, she started reviving again and coming to. And everybody was so happy and so thankful that Tink survived that. Now, this is a picture of Tink and Claire on the day that she received the Cat of the Year Award. That was an exciting day. Did you know that our God did something that no one has ever done? Just like Tink, our God saved us. Our God died for us because heaven was not a place to be that he wanted to be without you and me. So boys and girls, I hope you, when you think about cats and you think about Tink, you remember that God loves you. Okay, you can go back to your seat. Good morning and happy Sabbath to each and every one of you. We're thankful for our friends that have joined us this morning, and we're thankful for you. Pray that you'll be with us as we lift our voices together to sing to the Lord. You know, I'm thankful for TVA, their teachers and staff, as they were thinking 
as Chris and I were thinking, this month is somewhat focused on love, love for one another, love for your spouse and your children, love for God, and God's love for us is what we were thinking. God loves us so much, he sent his wonderful son into the world to tell us when he died on the cross. And this morning, the songs are about how much God loves us. Our first song this morning is going to be Jesus Loves Us. And the third verse is a little different than normal, but for those that are going through times of trouble, I hope you'll lean into those words because God is watching over you. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus loved me, he who died, heaven's gate to open wide. He has washed away my sin, and let his little child come in. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes. Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, loves me still, though I'm weary, weak, and ill. From his shining throne on high comes to watch me where I lie. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. You know, Jesus loves us so much that daily he wants to walk with you. And I hope that you want to walk with him. Our next song is The Lord and I. I have a friend so precious, so very dear to me. He loves me with such tender love, he loves so faithfully. I could not live apart from him, I love to feel him nigh. And so we dwell together, my Lord and I. Sometimes I'm faint and weary, he knows that I am weak, and as he bids me lean on him, his help I gladly see. He leads me in the paths of light beneath the sunny sky, and so we walk sorrows I tell him all my joys I tell him all that pleases me I tell him what annoys he tells me what I ought to do he tells me how to try and so we walk together my Lord
some weary soul to win. And so he bids me go and speak the loving word for him. He bids me tell his wondrous love and why he came to die. And so we walk together, my Lord. You know, the one thing is, the Bible tells us that Jesus will be with us always because he cares for us. Our next song is the one who no one ever cared for us like Jesus. I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus Since I found in him a friend so strong and true I would love to tell you how he changed my life completely He did something that no other friend could do No one cared for me like Jesus. No other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. All my life was full of sin when Jesus found me. All my heart was full of misery and woe. Jesus placed his loving arms around me. And he led me in the way I ought to go. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared Every day he comes to me with new assurance. More and more I understand his words of love. But I'll never know just why he came to save me. Till someday I see his blessed face above. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared. I hope uh, that you realize how much he does care for you and that he wants to be your dearest and most wonderful friend. What a friend we have in Jesus, our last song this morning. to bear what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer oh what peace we often forfeit oh what needless pains we bear oh because we 
do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in I'm feeling a little ornery this morning. I'd like us to do something we haven't done, if I'm not mistaken, for about four years before COVID. I'd like us to rise to our feet this morning and spend just a few minutes greeting each other in the name of Jesus, wishing each other a happy Sabbath. I'm going to give you about two and a half minutes so you can maybe have a radius of about four pews. Several years ago, I went to an ordination for a friend who was being ordained in the Episcopal faith. And I walked in, first of all, I walked in carrying my Bible. That apparently was a no-no. And then as I walked in, everyone kept saying to me, the peace of Christ. 
And I said, thank you. But apparently the proper answer is, and to you. So if you ever find yourself in an Anglican community and someone gives you the peace of Christ, and to you. Over the past month or so, Pastor Rodney has been preaching to us about the vital importance of prayer. And last week, Pastor Jeff gave us five practical tips on how to start or revive our prayer lives. So I think it's only appropriate for me to stand before you today and talk about the Swedish Navy. (laughs) That's right, the Swedish Navy. Now, when you think of Sweden, if you ever do, you probably think of Volvo, Ikea, Swedish meatballs or Swedish fish. If you are of a certain age, you might think of ABBA or a Swedish chef. Doopy doopy doo. But unless you are a historian, you may not know that about 400 years ago, Sweden possessed a formidable navy, one that controlled the Baltic Sea. My wife Marcy has made two work-related trips to Stockholm, Sweden. It's a tough gig if you can find it. I guess the convention center in Omaha was all booked up, so they went to Stockholm. She returned with these amazing pictures of the Vasa. The Vasa is a 64-gun Swedish galleon that was built for Gustavus Adolphus, king of Sweden. Unfortunately, she sank after sailing only about a mile into her maiden voyage in 1628. Over 300 years later, in 1961, the Vasa was recovered with a largely intact hull. Thousands of artifacts and the remains of about 15 people were found inside or near the Vasa. Since 1990, she has been housed in a museum in Stockholm and is currently one of Sweden's most popular tourist attractions. When she was built, Vasa was intended to express the expansionist aspirations of Sweden and its king, and no expense was spared in decorating and equipping her. In fact, she was one of the largest and most heavily armed warships of her time, and she was adorned with hundreds of carvings, which were all painted in vivid colors. From the waterline up, Vasa was beautiful and had no equal. Of course, when it came time to fulfill her primary purpose of sailing and defending the crown, the Vasa was a complete and utter failure. Capsizing in the bay because she was top-heavy and unstable. You see, before its launch, the king demanded that the ship be fitted with an extra cannon deck. His hasty orders did not take into account sailing characteristics, the shape of the hull, and his buoyancy measurements were not accurate. It seems that he was impatient to see Vasa join in the Thirty Years' War, which was ravaging Europe. Despite failing the stability test in port, Vasa was allowed to set sail. A stout breeze and open cannon bays were all it took to send Vasa to the sea floor. An inquiry was made, the captain was arrested, but no sentences were handed out as the king himself, who was considered infallible, had added the extra cannons and approved all the measurements. Well, there are many lessons to be learned from a story such as this. First and foremost, when your load is unbalanced, bad things can happen. Second, kings should leave shipbuilding to shipbuilders. But another key lesson is found in understanding the importance of ballast. Ballast is heavy material, weight that is placed in the hold of a ship to provide stability. In a small craft like a canoe, who is the ballast? (laughs) You're the ballast. But in a ship like the Vasa, even more weight is required. In the 1600s, the Vasa would have had a ballast of stone or sand. You can see right at the bottom here the stones. Modern ships put heavy equipment low in the hull and use stabilizers and ballast tanks that can be filled and emptied 
as needed. The purpose of the ballast is to counter the lateral forces that are placed on the craft by waves and on the sails by the wind. King Adolphus failed Ballast 101 because he did not understand a primary principle of ballast. More weight needs to be beneath the water than above it. You can have all the cannons you want if you have enough weight below the water line. In port, the Vasa was a most impressive ship. In a museum, it's an impressive ship. But she could not fulfill the purpose she was created for because of insufficient ballast. Today, we use the story of the Vasa to make a wide-ranging simile. I submit to you that some people are like the Vasa. They, too, have been created for a purpose, but have yet to fulfill it. Perhaps they have turned from their builder, their creator, to take design tips from another. Maybe they rushed out to sea or into battle before they were ready to sail. Maybe they successfully launched but have neglected the maintenance that their vessel demands to stay afloat. Vessels like these may be outwardly beautiful, ornately ornamented and outfitted, but beneath the surface, their ballast is deficient. At port and in calm waters, they survive, perhaps even thrive, but at sea, they are either overcome by the waves or they are pushed this way and that by the winds, drifting along passively, accepting the values of society, which all culminates in life-threatening shipwrecks. This is not what these ships, that is to say these people, were made for. God designed us for seafaring journeys, to unfurl our sails and catch the wind of the Spirit, to spread his love in uncharted places. And yet so many find themselves ill-equipped to face the open seas of life. We have a tendency to look past those vessels that don't have money, status, education, or beauty. But we can be thankful that Jesus sees below the surface, deep into the water, and he invites us to do the same. God has a mission for each of us and for this church. And on our missional pursuits, we certainly appreciate the contributions of smart and talented people. But our desperate need today is not for intelligent or gifted people, but for deep people. Today, we look at how to build ballast. Truly, there are many directions we could go in this quest. We know that we can build ballast by making the best of our time, by using our talents in ministry, by not getting bogged down by material possessions, by living a healthy lifestyle, and by allowing the grace that enters our heart to open our wallet. Good old-fashioned total life stewardship Without question, a Christian view of life is closely linked to the responsibility of maintaining or keeping our God-given vessel in as optimal condition as possible. If you're going to fulfill mission, our vessels need to be seaworthy. Building ballast in these areas matter. But within this moment of focus on prayer here in Beaverton, I would like to speak about another key way that we can build ballast— And that is by looking at our devotional life, and specifically the discipline of solitude. Yes, Adventists can have disciplines too. (laughs) I just read read a dissertation this week from Heather Cruz on early Adventist spirituality and how early Adventists use disciplines. Now, at the outset, I will tell you, this may be a hard word for some of you who identify as extroverts. But know that we introverts who just suffer through our greeting time are here to support you. Let us pray. Dear Lord, as we open your word this morning, we ask that you would challenge us. We ask that you would help encourage us to find ways to build ballast in our lives so that we can fulfill your mission. Speak to us and speak through us this morning, we pray. Amen. What is solitude? 
Solitude is retreating to privacy for spiritual purposes. It is not loneliness or boredom or isolation. If you're isolated, you are in danger. (laughs) You're painting a target on your back for the tempter. Solitude is strategic withdrawal. It is an intentional disconnection from external noise to foster a deeper connection with God. Full disclosure, I am not an exemplar of this art or discipline. So I think it's best we look to Jesus today. I made a quick list of Jesus' prayers this week. It's by no means an exhaustive list. I have here the prayers of Jesus, how and and why and the manner he prayed, and the occasion and purpose. There are several of these prayers that are in different Gospels. But here's a quick summary of what I discovered. Are you ready? (laughs) Jesus prayed in any frame of mind, in any place, at any time, with anybody. And secondly, and most pertinent to our presentation this morning, Jesus, when preparing for some great trial or some important work, would often withdraw to quiet places to pray. He sought out opportunities for solitude. I want to spend a few minutes looking at some of these times. And I want to do this because I hope you will clearly see that both before and after the great events of his life, and especially when life was unusually busy, Jesus practiced the discipline of solitude. Here we go. Jesus practiced solitude at the beginning of his ministry. Jesus inaugurated his ministry with baptism and then by spending 40 days alone in the desert. We read, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The word for wilderness or desert here is eremos, which can mean deserted place, desolate place, solitary place, or my favorite, secluded place. Jesus practiced solitude before making big decisions. In this case, the choosing of his disciples. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he designated apostles. It's never a bad idea to pray and spend some time in solitude before making major decisions in your life. Jesus practiced solitude while grieving the death of his cousin. Listen, when Jesus heard what had happened to John the Baptist, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Jesus practiced solitude when faced with success. After the miraculous feeding of the 5,000, we see Jesus' popularity is growing, and so are the demands of the crowds around him. In Matthew chapter 14 and verse 23, we read, After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. Jesus practiced solitude after work. Two examples. First, following a long night of healing and driving out demons. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. And second, when the twelve had returned from a preaching and healing mission, we read, then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, can you relate to that? He said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. I've got more. Jesus practiced solitude after serving or healing others. In Luke chapter 5, Jesus heals a man who is full of leprosy. He warns the man not to tell anyone, but the word gets out. Yet the news about him spread all the more, so that the crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Jesus practiced solitude after or before significant events. The scripture tells us, After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, 
So this is kind of solitude adjacent. He's got some others with him. And led them up on a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. And lastly, the one that probably came to mind when I started this sermon, Jesus practiced solitude before his arrest, trial, and execution on the cross. As he prepared for his highest and most holy work, Jesus sought the solitude of the Garden of Gethsemane. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. Any frame of mind, in any place, at any time, with anybody. Jesus' example teaches us that solitude is not a one-time event, but a regular practice. Clearly, Jesus knew the value of solitude. He knew that continual activity, even in the context of ministry, can wear us down if we do not take time to reflect, process, reevaluate, and rest. Solitude strengthens the soul. Now, I want to be clear. Jesus did not get away by himself just to get away from people. Okay? No, he used silence and solitude as a means of getting closer to God, which allowed him to then minister more effectively to people. He knew that he needed to maintain a close relationship with his father if he wanted to be successful in ministry. I think this is why Jesus retreated by himself so much. He was filling himself back up with God's love and power so that he could more fully love the people he came into contact with. I want to take a little deeper dive into how this worked. Read with me again from the Gospel of Luke. I want you to see a few things here. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray. There's the solitude. And spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples, his trusted small group. (laughs) And he chose 12 of them, who he also designated apostles. And then we have their names here. He went down with them. So we've got Jesus coming out of solitude. He goes down with them in his small group, and he stands on a level place, and a large crowd of his disciples were there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coastal regions. I want you to see this rhythm, this cycle. The people come, Jesus heals them. And it says here, because power was coming out from him in healing them all. Jesus' rhythm, my crude diagram. (laughs) He spends time in solitude with his father. He brings that power to his community. And then they're able to do public ministry. And it's a cycle. If you take your Gospels from Matthew to John and you start to look, you'll see this cycle over and over. Solitude leads to trusted and enlarging community, which leads to public ministry. Jesus spends time alone and then with his trusted friends and then faces the public. But solitude wasn't the end game for Jesus. He didn't found a monastery. I don't have buses out front to take you to a secret place. But without question, his mission to the multitudes was powered by his time in prayer on the mountain. I'll say it again this way. The primary place where Jesus drew his power to achieve his calling was in solitude. Where did Jesus get the power to cast out demons? To heal the sick, to raise the dead, to carry the cross? From his father in intimate moments of solitude. You might wonder, do we have access to this power? Perhaps. It's the same dunamis, the same power that Jesus gives to his disciples in Luke 9 and 10. In Luke's gospel in particular, you can chart Jesus' life along two axis points. The busier and more in demand and famous Jesus becomes, the more he withdraws to quiet places to pray. Often for us, it's the exact opposite. 
When we get super busy and life is hectic and people are vying for our time, the quiet times, the quiet place is the first thing to go. We might contrast Jesus' rhythm with that of our own. We get caught up in some task of ministry. We think we're doing a good thing. And maybe we are, but maybe it's for the wrong reasons. It doesn't go well. And so we run to our friends and our family and say, what happened? And they say, I don't know. And then at the end of the day, we're left alone wondering, (laughs) what happened? Solitude is a simple, though not always easy way to free us from the slavery of our occupations and preoccupations and to begin to hear the voice that makes all things new. It is a safe harbor, a time when and a place where you can let the Lord restock you, clean you up, and renew your purpose and empower you. If Jesus, our example, needed strategic retreats in his time, how much more do we need them now? You know I'm not one of those preachers, so I'm not going to beat this into the ground. <laughs> but I join John Comer in asking, how do we have any kind of spiritual life at all if we can't pay attention longer than a goldfish? How do you pray read the scriptures, sit under teaching at church, or rest well on the Sabbath, when every chance you get, you reach for the dopamine dispenser that is your phone. (laughs) Just a generation ago, we had forced moments of solitude. We had to wait in lines. We had to sit in rooms with other people. Maybe you had a magazine or a book. Now our digital carnivore keeps us company. All these little moments of boredom were potential portals to prayer. Little moments to wake up to the reality of God all around us, to draw our attention back to God. I fear the new normal of hurry and digital distraction is robbing us of the ability to be present to God, to others, to all that is good in the world, and to our own heart. As I reflected upon my own experience, I began to think that the shower is the only distraction-free place that I have. And I know some of you have radios in your showers. (laughs) I read this in a magazine this week. There are books to be read, landscapes to be walked, friends to be with, life to be fully lived. This new epidemic of distraction is our civilization's specific weakness. And its threat is not so much to our minds, even as they shapeshift under the pressure. The threat is to our souls. The noise of the modern world can make us deaf to the voice of God, drowning out the one input we need most. Solitude is important because it is the only place where we can gain freedom from the forces of society that will otherwise relentlessly mold us into something we were never intended to be. Now, I'm going to tell you the truth. I don't want to go back to a time before the internet. I don't want to go back to a time before this wonderful device. But we've got to get a handle on it. We've got to know its potential for good and the dangers, okay? If we can get a handle on it, then we have a message to share with those in our community who are harried. I don't know if you've heard this. Rodney, have you used this, the 21st century version of Psalm 23? Let's do it again. The clock is my dictator. I shall not rest. It makes me lie down only when exhausted. It leads me into deep depression. It hounds my soul. It leads me in circles of frenzy for activity's sake. Even though I run frantically from task to task, I will never get it all done, for my ideal is with me. Deadlines in my need for approval, they drive me. They demand performance from me beyond the limits of my schedule. They anoint my head with migraines. My in-basket overflows. 
Surely fatigue and time pressure shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the bonds of frustration forever. In today's fast-paced world, filled with distractions and obligations, we often neglect the practice of solitude and prayer. We find ourselves caught up in the whirlwind of activities, chasing after success, recognition, and material possessions, all the while neglecting the most essential aspect of our existence, our spiritual well-being. We try to find God in our, business, our busyness, our activity, and our noise, but we rarely find God that way. More often than not, he is there in the still and the quiet. A man working in a ice factory lost a valuable watch. His fellow workmen frantically searched with him for more than two hours through the sawdust on which the ice was stored, but they were unable to find it. They left the plant for lunch and returned to find a little boy with the watch in his hand. How did you ever find it, they inquired. He replied, I just lay down in the sawdust and heard it ticking. What is it that will keep your vessel sailing true this year? Is it the security of your material possessions? Is it your talent or your physical prowess? Is it your relationships? May I suggest, may I request <laughs> that you give solitude a chance? If we can do this, we can be of great benefit to others. Okay, preacher, I'm thinking about it. How do we do it? Well, if we, as we have seen, ballast is not primarily built by doing, but it is best developed by not doing. <laughs> Sitting in stillness and providing space for the Holy Spirit to speak and to work. But I do have a few practical things I can share. If you are a beginner to the discipline of solitude, or if you prefer strategic quiet time, I'd invite you to start small. First, take advantage of those little solitudes that fill your day. Consider those early morning moments in bed just as you awaken. Think of the solitude of a warm drink before beginning the work day. There can be little moments of refreshment and silence throughout the day. We just have to look for them and enjoy them when they arrive. Much like a hiker taking out their compass every so often to to check the direction they're heading, these moments can reorient us to God. How about this one? Don't turn on the radio for the first five minutes of your drive. Recognize God's presence as you ride an elevator alone. Walk through a park on the way home and be conscious of walking with God. Okay. Level two, some of you like structure. Set a specific time and perhaps a special space just for solitude so that even when there are other people in the house if they see you in that space they know that you are wanting as much solitude as can be afforded Susanna Wesley mother of John and Charles Wesley had a very large family when she needed solitude she would bring her apron up over her head and that told the children leave mama alone <laughs> one of my professors in seminary had a routine he had a special chair and he took his wife's hair dryer. It was one of these um, industrial hair dryers. And he would sit every morning in his chair under a tented blanket with her hair dryer warming him up. And that was his place of solitude. Be creative. Think of places and ways where you are comfortable and open to the Spirit of God. Do you travel for work? Dedicate a flight to solitude. Marcy and I were coming back from Amsterdam a few months ago. And we're seated, we're getting ready. I'm getting my tablet ready to watch a few movies. I'm thinking about uh, the food that's going to come to me. And here comes a man onto the plane. He sits two rows in front of me. He has no carry-on. He has no tablet. He has no books. He's got nothing. Amsterdam to Portland, 10 hours and 30 minutes. He's got nothing. He sits down. And I watched him for the whole flight. because This guy is crazy. Something's going to happen with this guy, right? Maybe, maybe he had dedicated that flight to reflection and solitude. I think he was crazy, but maybe, <laughs> maybe. 
Depending on your personality, you might want to read and meditate on Scripture or use a devotional guide to lead you into solitude. Now, don't, don't forsake your devotions for solitude. This is another piece, okay? Ask God to show you those areas of your life that need maintenance and repair. Ask for a renewed vision and purpose. Okay, you want to go advanced level? The Oregon Conference is hosting a weekend prayer conference next month. And I know they purposely build in times of reflection and solitude for attendees. There are also many Christian retreat centers here in Oregon that offer personal retreats. Some structured, some unstructured. I am happy to help you find something that works for you. Your schedule, your budget, your personality, your learning style. Come talk to me. Michelle, are you here? Come talk to Michelle, our prayer coordinator. If we can't help, we'll talk to Rodney. If he can't help, we'll Google it. Okay? (laughs) Come talk to us. Solitude and prayer are not luxuries reserved for the spiritual elite, whoever they are, but a vital necessity for every believer. What is stopping you from taking a day or two to think about your life goals, your accomplishments, your problems, your dreams, to seek the will of God for your life, to be filled with his? You might be running through your list of excuses right now. I'm I'm a full-time parent. I have a demanding job. I'm an extrovert. I have ADHD and so on. I just want you to think on this for a moment. Jesus needed time in quiet places. Jesus needed time in quiet places, a fair bit of it. Perhaps you do too. Don't let the fear of being alone drive you to noise and crowds and to digital distraction. You can cultivate an inner solitude that sets you free from loneliness and fear. Loneliness is inner emptiness. Solitude is inner fulfillment. Whether it's a quiet corner in our homes a peaceful walk in nature, or a retreat to a solitary place, please consider carving out space for uninterrupted communion with God. Why? Why do all this? As individuals, we build ballast to become the persons God created us to be. Solitude is where you find the strength to fulfill your calling. We build ballast to help us get through the storms on the sea of life to find our way to safe harbor. And as a church, we build ballast to help others through their storms. To build community, to fulfill mission, we need ballast. What kind of ship are you? The church needs all kinds of vessels, tugboats to guide others to safe harbors, Cruise ships to show hospitality. Hmm. We could probably stand to lose a few battleships and destroyers. We need lifeboat tenders to go into places we've never been. Pew Research study from last month. When Americans are asked to check a box indicating their religious affiliation, 28% now check none. Now, I'm not talking about Sally Field and a habit, okay? Not N-U-N. You have to Google that one, Jeff. (laughs) Not N-U-N. I'm talking about nuns, N-O-N-E. 28% of Americans just last month. In 2007, it was 16%. 16% to 28 in that period of time. By the way, it's uh, evangelical Christians, Protestants, 24%, Catholics, 23%, nuns, 28 the highest group. There are people out there that need us, okay? That need people that are grounded and have depth. As we settle into the new year, how much time have you allotted? How much effort have you invested in outfitting and filling your ballast with the things that will help you fulfill your purpose? How much of your time, talent, and treasure goes towards developing a solid spiritual foundation as opposed to adding outward trappings to your vessel or filling it with useless or lightweight, dangerous cargo? 
what kind of ship are you? A warship like the Vasa? A party boat? Today, Jesus invites you to be a fishing vessel. A little dirty, a little smelly, but purposeful. Sometimes when you stand here, you have moments of clarity. It occurs to me I've spent a lot of effort and a lot of time to come up with a lot of words to ask you to spend some time alone with Jesus. <laughs> if you do that, I think the Lord is going to send us a work far greater than the USS Rodney Payne II can do himself. If you keep showing up on Wednesday mornings at 6.30, it was 27, it was 33 last week, 36, 35. Did you count yourself? 35. If you keep showing up on Wednesday mornings, the Lord is going to demand more of us than the SS Jeffrey Bradburn can do alone. And I know it's more than that dinghy Jack Brown can handle, okay? <laughs> God's armada needs every seaworthy vessel we can muster. Will you join us? Jesus found it necessary to retreat to solitary places to commune with his Father. Despite his countless responsibilities, his pressing ministry, and the constant demands of the crowds, Jesus prioritized moments of solitude and prayer. He recognized the importance of disconnecting from the noise of the world to reconnect with the source of his strength and purpose. Today, I want to encourage all of us to look at our lives and prayerfully consider if we need to slow down to avert a shipwreck. I don't want to see you wrecked physically, mentally, emotionally, relationally, spiritually. Today, I am asking you to follow the way of Jesus and put a little more ballast in your boat. I know the ebb and flow, the tides of life, if you will, make this easier to do it sometimes than others. I know some personalities struggle with the idea of stillness, but our God is a powerful God, and he has reserved a portion of that power for you. Will you accept it? Have you heard God's invitation to you? Have you heard him say, come away with me, visit with me, let's get away for a while. Meet me in solitude so we can be together. Seek him today. Set some time aside to be alone with him. He would like that. And I think you would too. Would you stand with me for a benediction from the Gospel of Matthew? Are you tired? Worn out? Burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Amen. Amen.